is the lawyer's fund for client protection. Oh, that comes later. That comes later? Yeah, that comes okay. after this. This is January 2014. Okay. Good. Yeah. So oh, yeah. That's, this, yeah. This is when I filed the grievance on him. I went to these people here. Okay, let me read this. Yeah. Okay, on January 4th, 2011, Joseph Licari, a man who never gives up, went to the Departmental Disciplinary Committee, Supreme Court Appellate Division, First Judicial Department, 61 Broadway. And this is a letter from them, from Jorge Dopico. Dopico. It goes, Dear Mr. Licari, we have reviewed your complaint against Thomas F. Bello, Esquire. This attorney's office for the practice of law, as reflected in the New York State Office of Court Administration Records, is not located in Manhattan or the Bronx, and is, therefore, not within our jurisdiction. Accordingly, we are forwarding your complaint and any accompanying documentation to the appropriate grievance committee named below. Uh, Diana M. Carisi, Chief Counsel, Grievance Committee for the 2nd and 11th Judicial Districts, 335 Adams Street, Suite 24, Brooklyn, New York, 11201-3745. We will take no further action in this matter. Very truly yours, and it's signed. And uh, it looks like an old-fashioned letter. That's a, that's yeah. a, good, that's a good thing. That's that was done in, in 2011. That's when I okay. Then they sent it over to these people. Okay, so now this is personal and confidential, and this is uh, February 3rd, 2011, so they got right on it. Susan Korenberg, mm -hmm. assistant counsel, wrote you, and she goes, Dear Mr. Lakari, this will acknowledge receipt of your recent complaint. The committee has opened an investigation and the attorney has requested submit to submit a written answer to your complaint. When that answer is received, a copy will be sent to you for your reply. If you desire to submit a reply, please do so promptly. After that, you will be contacted if additional information is required. When the investigation has been completed, the matter will be reviewed by the committee for a determination as to what action, if any, is appropriate. You will receive written notice of the committee's determination. Please be advised that the function of this committee is limited to a determination as to whether there has been a violation of the rules and laws governing attorney conduct. The committee is not permitted to give you legal advice or act as your attorney and cannot assist you with conveying uh, monies, with recovering monies. You may wish to consult with an attorney of your own choosing regarding what legal remedies, if any, may be available. That's scary, if any. Mm -hmm. So then on, on March 11th, uh, March 9th, 2011, uh, she writes you another letter. In close, please find a copy of the attorney's answer to your complaint for your review and reply. Kindly forward your comments in writing together with any supporting documents to the committee within 10 days of your receipt of this letter. After the investigation of this matter is completed, you will be advised in writing of the committee's determination. So, um, you don't have what he wrote? These are just from her. Whatever I wrote, whatever I sent her. Okay. Then on the 28th, 2012, March 28th, so a whole year passes, this is, con this is to confirm that we will be meeting with you as follows. Wednesday, April 25th, 2012, at 2.30 p.m., and the place is the Grievance Committee for the 2nd, 11th, and 13th Judicial Districts, 335 Adams Street, Suite 2400, Brooklyn, New York, 11201. If you have any questions, please feel free to call. Thank you for your cooperation. Susan Korenberg. So can you tell me what happened in that one year from February 2011 until March 2012? Mm, nothing. I just waited for them for answers, you know. Okay, so so right away she sent you, a month, one, one month after February, she sent you the attorney's answer to your complaint. Mm -hmm. And then within 10 days, then you sent an answer. Okay. Answer, yes. So then, then they just percolated on it for a, for a year and what, then set yeah. a time. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's okay. Then we had the meeting in Brooklyn. We had the meeting uh, in Brooklyn on um, 
on the 25th of April 2012. Now, do you want to say what happened, or should I read the, the 31st, 2013? Well, I was there. She says, uh, she says, bring all the information that you have about Mr. Bello. And everything I found with his name on, I put part of all up, and I brought it to to this uh, committee meeting. And they were they were very very good. Two ladies, boy, they they screened everything about him, you know, everything. And they asked a few questions and so on and so forth, you know. And I answered, and uh, and that that was it. Then and, uh, and I was there for a couple of hours, but they went through everything. So then, then uh, so she says, okay, that was it, you know, they'll let us know. I just asked soon, she's going to take time and so on and so forth. So I had to wait. I wait. It was all a waiting game. And it, everything is in order there. And okay, so now, still down. okay, so that was the date, April 25th, 2012. Now we go on to October 31st, 2013. So this is a year and a half later. Okay. Okay, dear Mr. Licari. This is from a different person. The other one was assistant chief counsel. Right. This is chief counsel. Right. Enclosed for your information is an opinion and order of the appellate division, second judicial department, dated October 23, 2013. As it reflects, the court disbarred Mr. Bellow effective immediately based upon his resignation from the bar. Since Mr. Bellow has been disbarred, he is no longer an attorney and therefore no longer within the Grievance Committee's jurisdiction. Our file in this matter is now closed. The Grievance Committee is not permitted to offer legal advice or give legal assistance. However, you may wish to consult with another attorney of your own choosing regarding your legal matter. If you have not already done so, any claims for reimbursement of funds improperly taken by Mr. Bellow should be filed with the Lawyers Fund for Client Protection, 119 Washington Avenue, Albany, New York. Okay? These are the people here. Okay, and it gives a telephone number, 1-800-442-FUND, yeah. F-U-N-D. Or you can access their website at nylawfund.org. For further information and the appropriate claim forms, they may be able to assist you in recovering your money. On behalf of the committee, I wish to thank you for bringing your complaint to our attention. And sh this is Diana Maxfield uh, Carisi. Car Carisi? Yeah, Carisi. Okay. Yeah. Carisi, okay. Chief Counsel. Chief Counsel. And then this is the paperwork. That's okay. Supreme Court of the State of New York Appellate Division, Second Judicial Department, and Opinion and Order. It's quite a few pages. Oh, here. yeah. And it's signed by, uh, it's entered by Aprilene Agostino, Clerk of the Court. And it's also notarized. And it was filed October 24th, 2013. Matter of Bello Thomas F. Oh, you have to read and, what they said uh, about him. You have to read. Okay, Sh I'll okay. read that before okay. I read the other. Okay. And this is uh, Randall T. Ng, Rinaldo E. Rivera, Peter B. Uh, Scaleos, Mark G. Dillon and Ruth C. Balkin in the matter of Thomas F. Bello, an attorney and counselor at law, Grievance Committee for the 2nd, 11th, and 13th Judicial Districts, Practitioner Thomas F. Bello. Disciplinary proceeding instituted by the Grievance Committee for the 2nd, 11th, and 13th Judicial Districts. By decision and order, an application dated November 14, 2011, this court authorized the Grievance Committee for the 2nd, 11th, and 13th Judicial Districts to institute and prosecute a disciplinary proceeding against the respondent based on a verified petition dated January 3, 2011, containing three charges and referred the issue raised to the Honorable Arthur J. Cooperman as special referee to hear and report. By decision and order on application dated February 7, 2012, this court authorized the Grievance Committee for the 2nd, 11th, and 13th Judicial Districts to serve a supplemental petition dated December 2, 2011, containing 
uh, three additional charges and referring the issues raised to the Honorable Arthur J. Cooperman to hear and report, together with the issues previously assigned in the same matter. The respondent was admitted to the bar at a term of the Appellate Division of the Supreme Court on the Second Judicial Department on February 5, 1986. How beautiful. So they give the credentials of the law, of the judge. That's good. Our judge is not forthcoming about her bond or oath of office, so it's nice to see them saying since 1986. Diana M. Creasy? Creasy? Car yeah, that's it, yeah. New York, Susan uh, Korenberg of counsel for a petitioner. Howard Benjamin, New York, New York for a respondent. Per curiam, the grievance committee for the 2nd, 11th, and 13th judicial districts served a portion, but served a petition and supplemental petition on the respondent. Following a preliminary conference held on December 28, 2011, and a hearing conducted in nine separate sessions in 2012, the special referee sustained all six charges, concluding with the respondent, neglected the legal matters entrusted to him, dot, 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 failed to adequately communicate with his clients, dot, 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 failed to comply with court directives, and dot, 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 failed to honor a stipulation to which he agreed, end quote. The grievance committee now moves to confirm the report of the special referee and for the imposition of such discipline as the court deems just and proper. The respondent has now submitted an affidavit sworn to February 25, 2013, wherein he tenders his resignation as an attorney and counselor at law. C-22 New York CRR 691.9 and cross moves for its acceptance and the striking of his name from the role of attorneys. In his affidavit, the respondent acknowledges, in essence, that he cannot successfully defend himself against the merits of the charges. Charge 1, as amended, alleges that the respondent engaged in a pattern of neglecting legal matters entrusted to him in violation of former Code of Professional Responsibility, DR 6-10A3 and DR 1-101A7, 22 NYCRR 1200.30A3 and 1200.3A7. Between 2004 and 2010, the respondent was retained to represent 19 different clients and thereafter failed to diligently pursue those matters with respect to each of them. Charge True alleges that the respondent engaged in a pattern of failing to maintain adequate communication with his clients in violation of former Code of Professional Responsibility, DR 6-101A3 and DR 1-102A7-22 NYCRR 1200.30A3 and 1200.3A7. Between in or about 2001 and 2010, the respondent was retained to represent 18 different clients and thereafter failed to adequately respond to those clients' inquiries with respect to their cases. Charge, these, charge 3 alleges that the respondent failed to comply with numerous court directives in violation of former Code of Professional Responsibility. DR 1-102A5 and 722 NYCRR 1200.3A5 and 7. In or about December 2007, the respondent was retained to represent Tony Chin in a legal matter. In or about 2008, the respondent commenced an action on Mr. Chin's behalf entitled Chin v. U.S. Postal, Services, Postal Service in the United States District Court for the Eastern District of New York. Although twice directed by the court to provide it with a status letter report, the respondent failed to do so. The respondent also failed to comply with two orders directing the plaintiff to file inter alia affidavits of proper service on the defendant on or before December 22, 2008. By order dated June 16, 2009, 
The court dismissed the action in view of the respondent's pattern of delay and inexplicable noncompliance, end quote. Charge 4, as amended, alleged, alleges that the respondent engaged in a pattern of neglecting legal matters entrusted to him. Between 1999 and 2010, the respondent was retained by five clients. Thereafter, the respondent failed to diligently pursue their legal matters in violation of former Code of Professional Responsibility, DR 6-101A3 and DR 1-102A7, 22NYCRR 1200.30A3 and 1200.3A7. Charge 5, as amended, alleges that the respondent engaged in a pattern of failing to maintain adequate communications with his clients. Between 1999 and 2010, the respondent was retained to represent six clients. Thereafter, the respondent failed to adequately respond to inquiries made by these clients with respect to their legal cases in violation of former Code of Professional Responsibility. DR 6101A3 and DR 1102A7, 22NYCRR 1200.30A3, 1200.3A7. Charge 6 alleges that the respondent failed to timely satisfy the terms of settlement agreement in violation of former Code of Professional Responsibility. DR 1-102A5 and 7, 22NYCRR 1200.3A5 and 7. In or about 2008, the respondent was sued for legal malpractice in the Supreme Court, Richmond County, in a matter entitled Haynes, Hayes v. Bellow. In or about February 2011, the respondent executed a settlement agreement in which he agreed to pay the total sum of $25,000 to the plaintiff as follows, $5,000 within 90 days and balance within with six, it was a mistake, six months thereafter. To date, the respondent has failed to satisfy the terms of the agreement. The respondent acknowledges that his resignation is tendered freely and voluntarily, that he is not subject to coercion or duress, and that he is fully aware of the implications of its submission. He further acknowledges that the court has the power to disaffirm the special referee's report or issue discipline that could range from a public censor to suspension or disbarment. Nevertheless, he requests that the court accept his resignation and strike his name from the role of attorneys. The Grievance Committee objects to accept to acceptance of the resignation on the ground that the respondent's pro-offered resignation should have been offered prior to the hearing being conducted and the issuance of the special referee's report. The pro-offered resignation, which compiles with the requirements of 22 NYCRR 690.9, 691.9 is accepted and effective immediately. The respondent is disbarred and his name is stricken from the role of attorneys and counselors at law. The grievance committee's motion to confirm the special referee's report is denied as academic in view of the court's determination to accept the tendered resignation. And so this goes to Eng P. G. Rivera. Uh, Skelos, Dillon, and Balkin, J.J., concur. Ordered that the resignation of Thomas F. Bellow is accepted and directed to be filed, and it is further. Ordered that pursuant to Judiciary Law, Section 90, effective immediately, Thomas F. Bellow is disbarred, and his name is stricken from the role of attorneys and counselors at law. And it is further ordered that Thomas F. Bellow shall comply with this court's rules governing the conduct of disbarred, suspended, and resigned attorneys, C-22 NYCRR 691.10. Uh, and it is further ordered 
that pursuant to Judiciary Law Section 90 effective immediately, Thomas F. Bellow shall desist and refrain from one, practicing law in any form either as principal or as agent, clerk or employee of another, two, appearing as an attorney or counselor at law before any court, judge, justice, board, commission, or other public authority. Three, giving to another an opinion as to the law or its application or any advice in relation thereto. And four, holding himself out in any way as an attorney and counselor at law. And it is further ordered that Thomas F. Bellow has been issued a secure pass by the Office of Court Administration. It shall be returned forthwith to the issuing agency and Thomas F. Bellow shall certify to the same in his affidavit of compliance pursuant to 22 NYCRR 691.10F and it is further ordered that the pending disciplinary proceeding is discontinued and it is further ordered that the grievance committee's motion to confirm the report of the special referee in that matter is dismissed as academic and this is entered by Aprilane Agostino, clerk of the court. This is very peculiar because it's not really a ruling by a judge. It's discontinued. Mm -hmm. And that always is kind of suspicious to me. Although they accepted him, it didn't seem like you, you got any remedy. Did any of the other people get any remedy? No. So let's see. Here's October 31st. Um, I think you have two copies. Probably, yeah. Same thing. Okay, so I, I don't think I should read anymore. Oh, here's something. Here's January 6, 2014. That must be the same letter here. This is, you can read along as I'm reading. Dear Mr. Licari, I enclose Thomas F. Bellows' reply to your application for reimbursement from our fund. You are required to submit a response to Mr. Bellows' denial of dishonest conduct in the practice of law. Make note of anything you find misleading, inaccurate, or untrue. Please try to address each issue it presents and make your reply within three weeks. Feel free to call me if you require any further information or wish to discuss this matter. Thank you for your assistance. And this is Ray Wood, investigator. And this is where that other lady told you to go. Right. The Lawyers Fund for Client exactly. Protection. So did you answer within three weeks? Oh, yeah. I faxed him so many letters. You did. Is this one of them, maybe? No, that's, uh, no, that's Mr. Right. Bellows' response. He sent them a letter. Bellows. Okay. Let's read what Bellows said. This is December 23rd, 2013, so about a month before that came. Mm -hmm. Timothy O'Sullivan, Executive Director, the Lawyers Fund for Client Protection. Dear Mr. O'Sullivan, this is my response to the claim of Joseph Licari seeking reimbursement from your fund. First, I refer you to my letter of December 6, 2013, as a general explanation of the circumstances relating to my resignation from the New York State Bar. However, Mr. Licari's request for reimbursement war warrants further explanation. Should I read his other letter first? No, go ahead. Okay, I'll read this. I represented Mr. Licari in a federal lawsuit against a former employer of his several of his several years ago. I initially filed his claims with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, then filed in the U.S. District Court for the Southern District. The case was assigned to District Court Judge Dennis Cote. Ah. Upon my retirement in 2010, Mr. Licari failed to obtain new counsel and also failed to abide by court orders. As a result, the matter was dismissed. Subsequently, Mr. Licari sought to obtain a full refund of the fees he paid to me, which totaled approximately $8,500. Since it was obvious I performed legal fees far greater than any amount he paid, he took the absurd position that I borrowed 5000 from him. When I refused to entertain such an outrageous claim, he sued me in New York City Civil Court, County of New York. Mr. Licari hired an attorney to represent him, and the case proceeded to trial. 
Not surprisingly, there was a verdict totally in my favor. Mr. Licari, the arbitrator, the arbitrator, found had no claim either on his claim that it was a loan or on the theory of quantum merit. In other words, my fees were reasonable and justified in light of the work performed. Now he once again tries to assert this ridiculous contention to the fund. He makes no mention of what actually transpired as I have written above and affirms that what he writes is the truth under the penalties of perjury. I have written about this claim in more detail with the intention and the hope that your committee can see the extent to which some of my former clients are willing to go to obtain funds they simply are not entitled to, either under your rules or on any legitimate ground. As always, if you need further information, please advise. Sincerely, Thomas F. Bello. <laughs> and then there's that letter, but I don't see his December 6th letter. No. Um, former head of Staten Island Trial Lawyers Association disbarred for neglecting clients. Wow, he was the Staten Island Trial Lawyers Association. He was the head of it. <laughs> Staten Island, this is December 25th, 2013. Thomas F. Bellow, a prominent attorney who specializes in civil rights and employment discrimination law and once headed the Staten Island Trial Lawyers Association, has been disbarred for neglecting dozens of clients and failing to comply with court directives. Bellow, 61, who practiced out of West Brighton and Grimes Hill, has resigned as a lawyer, conceding he couldn't successfully defend himself against the allegations according to the Appellate Division Second Department. He was admitted to the bar in February 1986, said court documents. The sanctions were imposed after a disciplinary proceeding held by the Grievance Committee for the 2nd, 11th, and 13th Judicial Districts. Staten Island comprises the 13th District. A special referee sustained all six charges against Bellow, two charges each of failing to adequately communicate with clients and neglecting legal matters, and one each of failing to comply with court directives and failing to timely satisfy a malpractice settlement agreement. The allegations cover the time period from 1999 to 2010, said court documents. During those years, Bellow repeatedly violated the code of professional responsibility by failing to adequately respond to 24 clients' inquiries, court records says. He also failed to diligently pursue the cases of two dozen clients' state court, pa state court papers. Associate Clients Brooklyn Federal Court case was dismissed because Bellow didn't comply with court orders regarding document filing. You know, Joe once read a book when he was in a lawyer's office a long time ago when he was a young man and he was a cannabis provider. And the book said, what to tell your clients when you miss, when you miss deadlines. There was an entire book about what to tell clients when mm -hmm. you miss deadlines. Meaning that missing deadlines might even be part of the formula. You think that the lawyer is working for you because you gave him five or ten thousand dollars retainer um, but he may be taking that very money and giving it to lawyers working against you and spilling the beans about what your case is I mean I've, I've heard of one case of Lydia Raiden who's got a show called Crooked Doctors She'll, she'll be interested in your case. Oh, that'll be nice. But she, she made six telephone calls to Yeshiva University asking for her transcripts. These six telephone calls were put up as charges of aggravated harassment, and Lydia spent one year in Rikers Island for making six telephone calls. 
And the reason they did this is because they were churning students to sell them loans, student loans. Then they, after they sold them student loans, then they kicked them out with no hearing, and she had good, good grades. And then went and charged them for classes that she never took. So there was, there was a lot of fraud. Then when she got in Rikers Island, and they tried to give her mental evaluations, but she knew enough law not to sign anything. Uh, she became more aware with Medicare fraud that's going on. People are leaving Rikers Island, and they can go on the dole for $1,000 a month by being schizophrenic, but they have to take deadly medication. You know, so it's tricky. Bello also failed to pay a $25,000 settlement. Okay, we also we went through that. Uh, Bello and his lawyer could not immediately be reached Friday for comment. So what do you, what do you think? Is there any more for you to read here on him? No, I think no. that's it. What do you think? What do you think happened? What do you think is really going on? What do I think was going on? And continues. He's a sleazy dog. He's sleazy. I know, but he's so minor, isn't he? Yeah. You had a bigger case going when when uh, Miss Frawley was ceasing the the real estate advisory board and the right. super. Right. That was the real case. Right. That was the real case. That was. So after the union guy, what was his name again? Uh, yeah. Threw you under the bus. That yeah. You can't find. I, I, it'll come to me. I, yeah. Anyway, the union. Todd Jennings. Yeah, Todd Jennings. After Todd Jennings threw you under the bus, that's when you picked up Bello? No. I picked up Bello at, uh, let me see, I picked up Bello in November of the 2005. That's when I took, picked up Bello. Because from, from 2005, April of 2005 to November, Seven months this thing took. I was there for ten years. Ten years I was there. Perfect record. Nothing. Everything. Beautiful record. The Tennessee, they were generous to me. The company was generous to me. These three people there, they double-crossed me. They, it was premeditated what they did. Four-hour job I had. Four hours. Okay? Twenty hours a week. And it had a pension. The pension. I lost the pension because I didn't. I, when they took me off, I couldn't make up the time. See, because you need uh, you need about five six years. What What was the pension worth? What would it have been every month? The, the pension? pension. Well, I would have got half pay because I was a uh, because I worked half time. So maybe one hundred fifty dollars a month or something. But you know. So the present person that's doing this job, mm -hmm. because I was editing what mm -hmm. we shot last time, so I went yeah. through it more carefully. The person who's doing the job today, does he get a pension for four hours? No, he gets a pension for, for uh, 40 hours. Oh, because he's doing the four hours in addition? Right. They, they took my four hours and gave it to Louis Martinez. Because Louis Martinez was doing four hours daytime uh, lunch break and four, and four hours of Porter's work, okay? That gave him the eight hours for the day. So they took my four hours and gave him that four and took the Porter job away from him. Now he had to do eight hours. He had to do eight hours in a spread of 12 hours. Now Louis Martinez wasn't going for that nonsense. I know him. He wasn't going for that nonsense. But he went along with it and everything. He didn't want that, but they forced it on him and it was, you know, and that's what happened. And I was out in the street. I was the only one fired. So they he, fired me, not the company. The company didn't fire me. It's these two. They did it upon themselves. Yeah, that's another thing I didn't understand. Yeah. Miss, Miss Frawley mm -hmm. hired you as the board's director of the board. Right. But she fired you in, a, in another position. In a mother, in a mother. For she fired years. you when she took a new position. Yes. At the man was, yeah. was the management company there 10 years before when she hired you? Yes. Douglas Alleman was the manager. Douglas Alleman. Yeah. Douglas. She was, I, I, had, I had this old man's job, okay? She was 
president of the board of directors. Well, lovely lady, you know, very attractive. She was, a, she was working as a flight attendant, you know, okay. And I was working there and so on. Mr. Murphy says, Joe, he says, I got to speak to you. I says, yeah, what is it, Bill? Bill is a beautiful man. He says, Miss, Miss Frawley selected you to work a four-hour job, steady part-time job, to relieve, to relieve these other fellows for their dinner breaks. You know, it's one hour each, or 45 minutes each, four people. And he said, four hours a day, 20 hours a week, and I said, I'll give it a try. So I took that, like I said, for a whole loaf of bread, I wound up with a small piece of bread, and I was so happy with that small piece of bread. Now, this is going on. Because it gave you time with your wife. You could just, you could, you just, you came in for lunch and you came in for dinner, right? Who? You, you relieved. Tell me how you did the four hours. Okay, let me, let me get the, So I got the four hours. Now, like I say, for ten years, I had a perfect record. She was there. She was, she, she was the president of the board. How are you, How are you? And, you know, when we greeted each other and everything was fine. And, oh, Nancy, everything's fine. Joe, nice to see you. And so, you know, I respected her. She respected me. For 10 years. Okay. And after 10 years... But, no, but tell me again, what were the hours? At, 11, at 12 o'clock, you would go to one building while somebody was no, on lunch? No, my hours was from 6 to 10. 6 a.m.? Six, 6 in the evening. 6 in the evening? To 10 a.m. 10 a.m.? So you were. Uh, 10 p.m., I'm sorry, 10 p.m. 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. You're right. That's a lot of hours. No, that's one hour. Six? One to hour, 10. one hour, six to seven, seven to eight, eight to nine, nine to ten. They took their breaks then? Yeah. That was, was their a dinner breakfast break. break? Oh, that, oh, that was a dinner night. break. Night. Oh, so, so that was only a dinner, dinner break, not lunch. No, no, that's to Louis Martinez did that. That was his. Oh. I did four hours. That was, that was the only four hours I did. I see. That's what it was. I see. So they had to convince Martinez to pick up the, all the hours in between lunch and dinner. Right. So like I said, he had to do eight hours in the spread of 12 hours because he had to do lunch uh, morning break from 10 to 2. That seems yeah. inhumane. Is he not in a union? Yes, he was in the union. Well, doesn't the union do anything for people? He accepted it because Nancy, you know, this is the idiotic of this Nancy. She thought she was so slick and cute and everything. That's how stupid she was. Threw me out in the street. You gave him that. And he hated it. He didn't want it. He didn't want that. He didn't want it at all. And believe me, it didn't last long. After a while, he gave it up. He and what did they do today? Today, the four hours I had are still there. She said, oh, we, that's, that four hours has been discontinued. You know, if you read down the line, all that double talk that she's using, it's eliminated. It's, no more. it's still there. It's going to be there for another thousand years. These guys got to have their dinner breaks. These guys got to have their lunch breaks. You know, and that's it. And that's what happened. And all this took, now the ten years that I had, everything was perfect. Now she became management, okay? Management, she became there. She was on that job for a month, a month and a half. That's when she fired me. A month and a half she was on that job. Ten years. Everything was peaches and creep. Now she became building management. In a month and a half she fired me because of the superintendent, O'Sullivan. He didn't like me. He didn't like me. And he was very, very good friends with this Nancy. And he threw everything on her lap and she ate it up like, a, like an idiot. You know what I mean? So stupid. And that's how it all went on. For seven months I was fired three times. Okay, I was living my American dream. I was I was so happy, and that's seven months what they did to me. Seven months. I worked 60 years of my life. I never had a problem. 1944 to 2005, 60 years. I never had a problem. In seven months, look what they did to me. Okay, that went on. They fired me. They hired me. They fired me. They hired me. They... Okay, now it came. At the end of 2005, November, that was the end, and that's when I got Mr. Bello. I was introduced to him, then he came into the picture, and he took my case. He said, oh, don't worry about it, we'll file age discrimination. Okay. okay, I was glad to get a lawyer. I said, oh, God, at least I got some. But it went on for five years, and just went on and on and on, and did nothing. Finally, he says, oh, the EOC got in touch with me, Joe. And the O.C. says, we got a right to sue. I said, well, 
outside and after five after years. After five years? Six years, you know, on a, on a four hour job? Come on, Paula. For, that never should get off the ground. And all over the United States, it never should get off the ground. That four hour bit. Anybody going to get out of here, they'll say, but you, you're stupid. Okay. So he took it. So he calls me and says, okay, Joe. He says, I need the $500 for court cost. No problem. He came over to my apartment. I gave him a check, the blank checks. Why did you give him the blank check? That seems a very foolish thing to do. Well, that's what I did. You mean you wrote it for $500? No, no, I didn't write nothing. I signed the check. But he could have written 50000 He could have, but he didn't. He didn't. And we, you know, trust it. So I gave him the check, and uh, I signed it, and he filled it out. He didn't fill it out then, he took it with him. But in the meantime, he says, Joe, he says, I need a favor from you. I need to borrow $5,000 from you. He says, Joe, and this money I'm going to pay you back. And he repeated again. He says, Joe, he says, this money I'm going to pay you back. And believe me, I, <laughs> I quenched a little bit, you know. But he caught me, he caught me off guard because he got to write the sue and everything, you know. And uh, I just thought, he caught me in a good mood. So I gave him another check. I signed it. Okay. And he filled out the rest. Okay? Okay. And as soon as I gave them two checks, he ran like a thief, went to New Jersey, and cashed that same day. One was for 500 one was for 5000 The 500 court cost. Then when I got the, the return receipt of the of the check, he's got a, he writes down court cost, 5000 How many times you got court cost? One for 500 then another one for 5000 He fills in there, you know. Okay. He said it was for federal filing. That's, that's what, what he claimed. Yeah, that's what he said. Did it say that on the notation? I got the checks here. Oh. You want to see them? I'll show it to you. Yeah. Yeah, I'll show you the checks. Okay. That's what he said, federal filing. There is no record of that federal filing. I want that today. Even over here when I wrote to Mr. Mr. Woods, I says, please, because Mr. Bellow says, if anything that, uh, that you want from me, and I wrote to Mr. Woods, Ask him about the federal findings. Get a copy of that. Get a copy of it. Of that, that he says. Get a copy of that. And there's no copy there. Trust me, Paula. There's no copy. So what do you think he is? He's a do-nothing lawyer that's sort of paid to be like a, a, a he, shill or a, a, a... He's a sleazy jerk. You know what? But it, I mean, sometimes... Sometimes much worse things are hiding behind sleazy jerks. So we yeah. have to quickly get beyond the sleazy jerks to get at the meat of it. Like my, I'm still trying to figure out who has your pension today? What happened to the pension? Nothing. Nobody. Well, I'm thinking we could do a forensic examination yes. and find out where did that $150 a month go? Went into the, went into the fund. Goes right into the fund. Well, I don't know about it. Nobody claimed it. They, they, nobody has had the right to claim it. They're getting their pension. They're getting. Uh, they're still working. All of them are still working. These fellas. They're all still working. They're all still working. I was the only one that was left out in the cold. If you hadn't lost this job, you'd be working there today. Of course. I lost thousands. Of Paula, every Christmas I was making $10,000. $10,000 I was making. That's why this stupid superintendent, he was jealous of it. That's what, that's that whole thing. Because he was jealous I was making that money. $10,000 I was making a year. Because of the tips. Right. Right. That's what, not a perfect record. Perfect. Right. That's what it is. This stupid judge convinced this stupid frolly, and she went for the okie doke and everything and everything. So I don't know if you ever read this piece here. But why is she writing to the real estate advisory board? That's because she's happened. stupid. She's stupid. The other guy, Angle, he's gone. I called up the guy, the other guy, Angle. He was the, the president of the board of directors. He left a few years ago. Why send him? Well, he's got nothing to do with it. This is the, 
She's a letter writer. She's stupid. You know, all the stupid letters that she wrote, all the kaiswags and you know, everything. You would think somebody would be happy if they're getting a lot of tips, because that's an indication that people like them. Yeah. And you don't have to give them any money. No. No. And he was getting his tips. He was jealous what I was making, because I beat everybody. I beat everybody in tips. I beat everybody. But they didn't know it. You didn't tell them. You didn't brag, did you? I didn't brag, because every time... Uh, when we went down, <laughs> we go down to, into the locker room and everything, and Izzy, Izzy Batnacourt, all the, the checks would go through the office, the envelopes, you know, and they would give it to Izzy. So, okay, Izzy gets, lines everybody up, and, he, and then we would sit there, and he's, oh, 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 Owen's next, desk is next there, and he's listening. And Izzy would say, Joe LeCarry, 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 he's listening. Joe LeCarry. All them checks, they were just piling up for me. And this guy was eating it up, he was getting sick. That's what happened. It wasn't confidential when, uh, you know, as he came, okay, uh, okay, Martinez, this is Martinez, Martinez, this, okay, Joe LeCarry, Joe LeCarry, uh, Henry, this. That's what it was. Joe LeCarry, Joe LeCarry, that he was burning his ass. So I guess the moral is that people should be tipped quietly. Yes, but that's the way the system was. But, but you see, it's been going on for a long time. It's only when this guy Sullivan came on board, that's when the things happened. I worked for four superintendents, nothing ever happened. You know, nothing. We got a long frame with it. This guy was no good. The tenants didn't like him. The crew didn't like him. They hated him. He had no personality whatsoever. He was a dog. He was a dog. But he finally left. In one year, okay, this was 2005, 2006, Miss Frawley was fired, and O'Sullivan was fired, okay? They were both fired. Really? Yes. By who? By the company. By um, Douglas Elman. Douglas Elman. Douglas Elman and uh, London Terrace Towers. Did they say why? Paula. Was that in 2007? 2006. 2006. Right after I got fired, they got fired. Paula, there's not a company in the whole United States. No company wants a grievance against them with discrimination. They are against that. Any company, when they get some discrimination, oh my God, they hit the ceiling. They frown on that. They don't want no discrimination cases against them. And that's what happened. And I filed it, age discrimination, and I kept writing letters. To, I was faxing letters to Douglas Elman, uh, uh, London Tempest Towers, and there was another one. There's three of them. They all had the same address on Madison Avenue, and I faxed them letters, faxed them letters, faxed them letters, this and that. And that. They never gave me, but they piled it up. Inside that one year, they both got blown away. Because they don't want no discrimination case against it. None. No company in the world. And that's what happened. So they got, both got fired. What you did to me, what you prove? What'd you, then my lawyer. <laughs> just goes on and on. And it's so ridiculous. But I think the union guy needs a little discipline. Them two sleazy bastards. Them two. There's two of them. There's got Todd Jennings and there's another guy. Can I show you letters? I wrote to uh, this guy here, uh, Mr. Stern. His name was Stern. He used to be the president of the uh, of the AF of all AF of L and CIO. He used to be the president. Okay. Wow. Oh yeah. Wow. So as time went by, then he he resigned that, and he became the president of this SCIU union, which is huge too. Which is huge. He became president. Okay, I sent him a letter, receipt requested, and he gave me an answer. He says he couldn't handle that because it was a separate uh, thing with the, the same union, FCIU, which I didn't pay him no mind. It's still the same union, but the, because of uh, because this was a uh, uh, how do you say it? Um, Discrimination. No, because the, the union the the union was a separate entity, you like or something, you know, like it was a local. Like he had nothing to do with the local. But he says, I'm going to forward your letter to Mr. Fishman. He was the president of the CIU. And he got the letter. And he sent me a letter back. That he received the letter from Mr. Fishman, from Mr. Siegel. 
and uh, that he's going to send some guy to hand, handle my case from SEIU. Another. Nothing. So I met him. Nothing. We sat down and he, he had no record on me when I went to see him. Everything was verbal. And I'm listening to him and I said, you know, I'm listening to him. I've been in the union for 40 years. You just started. <laughs> you know, I was an official of a union. Well, hell, you can, you can dictate to me, you big jerk. Oh, look at this. This is what the company says. Look at this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is what the company says? Look. You see, you see. <laughs> policy, policy. Yeah, you right? see. Yeah, see. So, you know. <laughs> oh, look at, look at these jerks. And that's what he says. Oh, he says, uh, uh, I don't think we can go to, 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 to arbitration with, you, with, uh, with your case because I don't think we can win and all that. And, and that's it. Case closed and out. Out the door. And right. he's talking about arbitration. What about a real trial? What about never a real went, trial? Never went to arbitration. Never went anywhere. Nothing. Nothing. Where's the laws? Where's, the, where's, where's my rights? Well, see, because so much time has passed, I'm sure the statute of limitations is over. Unless, unless there's fraud involved. And I'm thinking, I have no idea how to do it, but if there's a way to examine where your pension goes, because each dollar bill has a number on it, it's yes. a QCIP number. Yes. Each U.S. birth certified uh, citizen has a number, and that number supports the currency. Okay, so maybe. there must be a way, Joseph, to find your pension. Maybe I could find something here. Well, I mean, I'm not saying you you have it in your papers, but yeah. unless we can determine that there's fraud involved... Maybe I could see here. You can't. The statute of limitations is over. I know, but, uh, but pension monies is something different. Oh, really? It well, has no statute of limitations? That's your pension money because of fraud. You use my pension money for some uh, from some other political thing. That's what you did. Right. You definitely supposed to go into my fund. That's how I didn't get no pension because they get no credit for it. But even worse than that, they're securitizing any kind of cash flow. Mm -hmm. So if they get you out of the picture, then one hundred and fifty dollars a year a month coming in mm -hmm. can be securitized. Yes. And it could fraudulently spin off thousands of dollars a yes. month. Yes. Yes. And people like. Like Frawley and the other super might have been in on it. You, you know, I'm just, this is a wild speculation. No, nah, they weren't in on it. They were stupid. They, uh, they, they were dumb. They weren't. Uh... Oh, yeah. But why would the union not protect you? The union's not dumb. That guy's not dumb. They're yeah, really idiots. They're a bunch of, I don't know what was behind it. We what? have to figure it out, okay. Joseph. If we don't figure it out, you see, the reason most people lose in court is they don't have a clue mm -hmm. of what's happening to them. Yeah. They know they're hurt. They know it doesn't feel good. But they, we need to know the who, where, what, when, and how. Okay. Because who, where, what, right. when, and how. Yeah. Because who, where, because what did Miss what did Miss Florida give the, these two of this bottle of whiskey? They're not going to. That, that's amongst them. The company didn't give them no money. The company had nothing to do with it. Just between them. So what did they, they give them? Well, a bottle of whiskey? These two cheap thugs? They're cheap jacks. They, could, they couldn't be in such a high position just to be a cheap jerk. They were delegates. A union delegate. Cheap thugs. That's all they are. You believe that? Yes. The cheap. union would risk its reputation? With <laughs> Yes. What about a disciplinary committee for them? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Do they not have that? No. no, no you know, them union. Here, read that's where that's outlined there. Um, focus on commercial real estate. And it says SEIU Local 32B, right. which represents doorman, janitors, and other building maintenance workers will hold a strike a strike vote on Thursday, the union confirmed. Commercial building owners presented their contract proposal last week through the Realty Advisory Board. Okay, now I see. Realty Advisory mm -hmm. Board. And met yesterday again to discuss it. 
The proposed called for no change in wages or benefits for current employees and other alterations to work rules and management restrictions. Sources said the union is most upset about a proposal for a two-tier system for new hirees and the owner's desire to no longer take any contributions for the union's political action fund from wages, which lowers the take-home pay. The contract ends on New Year's Eve for the roughly 20,000 workers in 1,000, it's kind of messed up here, area buildings who are the highest paid in the U.S., and who say they are prepared to strike. Stay tuned. Now, what? When was this? This doesn't say. Oh, well, that was is, 2000. Yeah. This is two. This that is was November the last contract. 30th, 2000. That was the last contract. Now you see there. The real estate advisory board. Now you see there with them two years, the newcomers there. That money was pension monies. That money was supposed to go towards your pension. Instead, they took that money and they used it for that contributions in Washington and, and so on and so forth. That's against the law. That's pension monies that they took from me. I didn't give you no okay to take that pension from me. You know, they took the pounds of sick. That's what they say. They were, they, they were, they, they said they were annoyed. Uh, the union was annoyed that the company says no more. We're not going to give that money anymore. And the company was, they says, oh. Because before the money was given by the company for pensions, now the mon now the company's saying since it's not going for pensions, we don't want to give it. Well, they didn't mention anything about pensions, you know. But that's but that's that's what that money was for. That two years, that two tiers for the newcomers, you know, new guy comes in, he's okay. You got to sacrifice this for two years. You're getting all your benefits, but that extra little money that's supposed to go to your pension, which it never did. It went to. The, po the political business that they were using. Well, what about pensions for, for union workers? Isn't that the whole point of being in a union? Yes. pension? Yes. But that's what I'm saying. That two years, I had four years pension monies. But that two years that they took it away from me, that would have been six six years pension money, so I would have got a piece of the action. But I didn't cut that mustard for, for that six years. Because that was fraud, what they did with that six, that, that two, them two years. They didn't t had no right to take my money and use it for political business in Washington, D.C. Well, how do they get away with it? You're not the only one that's discovered that. They it. did it to every friend. You know how you and they couldn't care less. They're making good money. I'm just the one that observed this. You know what I mean? Right. I observed this. Right. When I looked, I said, oh, look at that. That's right. where that's... Right. And what happened after that? As soon as this was all over, what happened to the president of the union? He quit. Because he couldn't get touch that money, that was millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars that went that that the company stopped giving him. millions. I'm talking about millions. I'm not talking about a couple of pennies. Millions of dollars from every member, every member. Well, Bello doesn't sound like the man for the job to clean this up. Well, Bello had nothing to do with this. No, but I'm saying, how do you straighten it out now? Where do we go now? Well, I don't know. It's a good question because that's a federal thing. That's federal money. Now, where's my pension? Oh, well, okay, yeah, you tell me this and that. Yeah, but what about this? This money was supposed to go towards my pension. You gave me credit for everything else, but that money there didn't go to the pension. You used that for political business in Washington, D.C., where you gave them so many millions of dollars every year, you know what I mean? To take care of themselves. And the President Fishman, every day, you know, them guys there, they, <laughs> they grab that money, they stuff it in their pockets. And since they stopped that, President Fishman, he retired because he couldn't get into that money no more. You understand? Can't touch the Siemens, how do you call it that? Can't touch their uh, their money for, that they're paying, their dues money. Can't take that because that dues money pays for the rent, pays for this, pays for that, pays for their salary and everything. Can't get. But the other one was all gravy money. You understand? That was it. That was all that gravy money they got. That's where it happened. That's where my pension went. They fraud. That's that's why I didn't get no pension. That's why I'm saying, a person like you, 
if you can keep your balance, keep your calm, don't let it stress you out, huh. but just move forward uh -huh. and state your case just like you're doing it here on camera. Yeah, yeah. Except in a court. Yeah. In a real setting with a jury. Uh -huh. Not any of this arbitration. No. Oh. You want a jury. Yeah. A jury of your people. That's yeah, a jury. That's what I want. I want a jury. Right. What an arbitrator. And and any anything over twenty dollars, the Constitution says we're entitled to a jury of our peers. Yes. And even the Supreme Court cannot overturn a jury's decision. Uh, uh, that's right. So, no, I want a jury of my age and everything. If I could present, if I could present everything down down the line. But you can't do it with the lawyer because then the lawyer will talk and then you'll say you didn't say this, you didn't say this. At the last minute, they say it, they screw it all up. You've got to, you've got to make up your mind that you want a jury trial, yes. and you are going to present the material. In other words, what is that? Was that, is that pro se? Is that what they say, pro se? Well, pro se means to represent yourself, but you don't even want to represent yourself. No. You want to be yourself. You say, no. I'm the guy. I'm the harm party. Oh, I, that, here I am. Oh, okay. Yeah. And here's what happened to me. Okay, okay. What do you think, jury? No unions, no lawyers, just just the facts, ma'am. Okay. Just get the facts on all, the all right, that sounds good to me. Yeah. That, that sounds good to me. Okay, pro se. No, okay. Well, that they, they use the term pro se, but in 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 law, it you're still representing yourself as a corporation. See, a corporation can't speak. Mm, right. A corporation always has to be represented. Mm -hmm. But a human being, a, 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 a flesh and blood living soul doesn't need to be represented. Mm -hmm. A flesh and blood living soul is himself or herself. So you just state your case before your peers, not before corporate peers. Right. Not before judges that are paid off by special interests or even I've even gone down to the local precinct and I said, who do you work for? Do you work for the people or do you work for the bankers? Yeah. Because if you took an oath of office and you work for the people, and if I go up on my roof and they say I'm not supposed to be on the roof mm. and they call you, what are you going to do? And he said they ask for identification. He, he proudly says, we don't work for the banks, we work for the people. Mm, yeah. And I said, well, the banks are going to try to say that I'm a legal fiction and that John Doe or Jane Doe lives here, so they won't care about my identification. Anybody that lives here, they're going to remove us. So. If you know who I am, if other people know who you are, it doesn't make any difference mm -hmm. in this in this sort of legal, fictitious world. Mm -hmm. But in the real world, where we all breathe and live and so on, and, and we need our pensions, like this, this thing about your pension, this is so important because this is the real world. People... Yeah. They get older, they can't work, they need to retire. Yes. When they're retired, they need their pension. Yes. There's no way you can get around that. Yes. That's reality. Yes. Because you got a question. Where's the, what, where's this tooth? This tooth well, that's what it says. All newcomers. All new members that come in. Yeah. So for the two years, you don't... Uh, uh, that, yeah, that's pension money that they took. You got everything else. You got your, your vacation money. You got your sick day money and everything. What happened to this little baby money that they took? This, this two-tier money they say for newcomers. What happened to that money that you put right. in your pocket? And right. that's that's where it's at. Well, where's, where's this money? Right. That's why the company says no more. So we're going to stop that with the, because whatever money that you took out of there, now the worker has that money to put in their pocket that we were giving you. You understand? This is right there. Right. Now the workers they got extra money to put in their pay in their paycheck. It's right there. That's what that two-tier nonsense is. Yeah, right. And they screwed a lot of that's millions and millions so and millions of dollars. So you don't have any pension at all? Oh, I got pensions. From other jobs? Yeah, from other plans. I'm getting Social Security, but yeah. you know, it's a fixed income that, right. you know, I got to pay my maintenance and everything, and uh, right. I got a couple of dollars a week extra, you know, but yeah. uh, no, so I'm getting two pensions, one from my Siemens Union, you know. Oh, right, because you were a merchant marine. Yeah, I'm getting one from there and one from P&W. I'm getting, from my from my Siemens Union, I'm getting $519 a month. Then from P&W, I'm getting $353 a month. And then... Uh, a partial check from Virginia, I get $140 a month. Social Security, I get $1,190 a month. Something like that. 
So it's, you know, it's... Uh, so you can get by and... So I'm a little above, I'm, I'm just a little above water, you right. know. Right, but, but you got to be vigilant because, you know, this economic downturn that nobody's addressing the fraud. They keep looking the other way. Yeah, yes. And what that means is it makes, it makes life very difficult to have the leisure time that you need to develop the culture. Yeah. That we that we would be proud of throughout the yeah. world, and instead the world is knowing us by these banksters. But you see, like I say, Paula, if you can put all this stuff together, what I have. Yeah, you've done a good job. And this way, I can go rattle off page at a time, page at a time, page at a time, and just the way I rattle off, just the way I got it, and that's I'll take my time, and that's how that's all I need. It's like a book, page one, page two, page three, page four. Yeah. That's what I need to put together. Right. Then I got something that I can, hey, right. it's all here. Right. The whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Right. And that's the way I'll address it. So if there's anybody out there in Manhattan that knows more than me and Joseph about what's going on, email me at rabbitholecentral at earthlink.net or stop by yourself at 26 Gramercy Park, 7H. Uh, I'm always delighted to meet with uh, living soul, flesh, and blood people and, uh, and just discuss how we can sit down and make a better New York. Yes. Because a better New York is going to come with better communication. Yes. And Joseph, thank you for joining me. Yes. Because yeah, that's what I'm saying. If I get somebody to put everything together,